as I said, John and I were looking over the last three semesters in this one, and we've had an amazing array of people. We've had former United States presidential candidates, governors of major states. We've had uh, five, six, for, either current or former secretaries of uh, major executive agencies in the state. We've had at least one Nobel laureate. We've had um, great uh, authors uh, and great journalists, and of course a whole array of unbelievable set of academics. But tonight, you are going to meet two of the most interesting people that we have ever had, um, because I've seen both of them speak. When are they arriving there? Yes, well, that will be here soon. Uh, actually, this is Jay Leno, Jay Ash, uh, who is the city manager of Chelsea and a dear friend of mine, um, someone who, in my estimation, uh, is the model for what a great city official should be. In fact, on Saturday, I am keynoting a plenary session at the National League of Cities, uh, and I will be discussing uh, a project that we developed here, and Jay and the city of Chelsea were among the first to participate in it, called the Economic Development Self-Assessment uh, Tool. But um, Jay was appointed in 2000, now almost a decade ago, to be city manager of his own native city of Chelsea. I think the average uh, length of city managers in any one city is about 14 months, so he's been there quite a bit of time. And he has um, been important in the resurgence of that wonderful city. Um, outside of Chelsea, Jay has led statewide initiatives on health insurance, on youth violence and transportation infrastructure. Um, he's uh, uh, been involved in all the key issues. Uh, he is the president of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, the council that represents 101 cities and towns in Greater Boston, uh, that is really the planning agency for what should be this region. Um, and he's also a member of Mass Inc. Um, the Boston Business Journal named Jay one of Boston's 40 most promising up-and-coming business people under the age of 40 in 1947, uh, <laughs> 1999. Uh, he just looks young, but he has um, done wonderful things. I saw him for the first time address a group um, in one of our downtown hotels, and he played two roles. Uh, the economic development director of his own city and a prospective firm that was looking at a city. And he actually played both roles simultaneously on stage to a standing ovation. Our other speaker, um, I have seen speak often and he is not quite as much fun. Uh, Michael Whitmer is the president of the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation. And he is responsible for, among other things, telling the governor how much less money the state has every four or five days. <laughs> Michael has been president of the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation since 1992. There were years in which he actually had good news for the mayor and good news for the governor, uh, but that is not one of them. Uh, he joined the foundation in 1990 after more than 20 years of management and political experience in both the public and private sectors in Massachusetts. Formerly was with the Cabot Corporation, and uh, he also served in the Sargent Administration uh, as Special Assistant to the Secretary of Human Services, and as he also was part of the first Dukakis Administration as the Governor's Director of Communications and Deputy Chief Secretary. Uh, the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation is one of my favorite organizations in the state. Um, it's one of those organizations that tells the truth. It's one of those organizations that does extraordinarily careful work. And indeed, I try and pattern the work we do at the Dukanka Center after the marvelous work that is done at the Mass Taxpayers Foundation under Mr. Whitmer. The foundation has won uh, a large number of prestigious awards nationwide for its work on a wide array of municipal topics. So you are in for if, you know, an enjoyable evening, but also an evening of kind of understanding the kind of <coughs> problems we face now and hear both how 
at least one city manager is trying to handle very bad news and very difficult times and also get a better idea of where we face, what the problems we face now. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if Mr. Whitmer, Michael, wouldn't be also talking about some of the problems we may face in the very near future. <coughs> I give you Jay Ash. You know, uh, it's a humbling experience anytime you're on Barry. Um, all of you who have uh, had the opportunity to learn so much from him know that. Um, over the years, um, I've learned so much from Barry. I, I actually look forward someday to being able to actually apply what I've learned, Barry, from you. It's just been so much that I'm not sure that I'll ever be able to apply it, but it's been so much. And uh, I know that Paul can't be here tonight, but uh, Paul Brogan has been a, uh, an instrumental leader in our community. Um, and um, together, you and Paul and John and Northeast are, are doing something that we need to do more of in this Commonwealth. It's to um, have an open dialogue about uh, the problems that we face. You know, too often it's all about sound, sound bites that we see on television as opposed to uh, serious discussion about issues. And uh, forums like this help to bring people together. I, I see people in the audience that uh, I know and I've worked with. And I also want to point out that I brought my city council president, Brian Hatterberg, with me. So uh, I have one of 11 bosses here, so I have to be able to a little bit better behavior. <laughs> Um, the, the point is that um, you know these types of dialogues are important as uh, as we consider um, the difficult challenges that we have before us, and there are plenty of difficult challenges. Um, Barry uh, said, "Jay Leno, I, I think I'm going to take the role of Ross Perot tonight instead." So um, I'm hoping that um, many of the stats that I'm going to uh, present tonight are of interest to you, and I uh, certainly hope that the uh, giant sucking sound you hear isn't the presentation itself. So we'll, we'll do our best on that. Um, um, let's see if I can get this going here. No, nope, I need the. I got it. So, uh, let's start with our, our presentation here tonight uh, Municipal Finance in the Commonwealth, or as I like to call it, Going Broke and Massa Chaos. Um, chaos uh, is the emphasis here in Massachusetts, and, and uh, my good friend Mike Whitmer uh, is going to um, certainly talk more about the chaos that exists in the state. Um, you know, the cities and towns of the Commonwealth are affected by the chaos that happens uh, at the State House. So uh, considering the mass chaos is, um, is, is very important in looking at what's happening with um, cities and towns around the Commonwealth. So uh, I want to test you all, if I could. Uh, I'm going to take you back to your old SAT days. And uh, first, uh, analogy question. Uh, kids are to parents as municipalities are to the state. state. The state. Very good. Very good. Well, I'll bear you right. Very smiling audience. Um, you know, uh, kids cannot do things on their own without permission of parents. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon which side you're on here in Massachusetts, um, the state controls what cities and towns do. When we talk about the chaos that the state is feeling, this is especially important because uh, if you can imagine a home where the kids are doing well, but the parents aren't doing well, the family is going to be dysfunctional. And that's basically what's happening today in Massachusetts. Many cities and towns, including Chelsea, have been doing well for years. But the state's chaos, the state's dysfunction, the state's dysfunction um, is creating problems now that we can't avoid. So in that household where the parents are fighting, the husband's <coughs> out of work, the wife's out of work, um, and the kids seemingly have all kinds of problems, well, that's what uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts are facing. And, and unfortunately, um, our parents won't allow us to go out and do the kind of things that we want to do in order to take care of the chaos ourselves. So, um, you know, for many of you, it's the same old, so uh, same old story, same old song and dance, my friends. Uh, disappointed that Stephen Tyler is talking about breaking up with Aerosmith. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk about what's happening in cities and towns these days, um, expenses uh, continue to go up and up and up, um, especially employee overhead, and we're going to talk a lot about that um, here today, uh, but also capital expenses. And uh, what goes up on the other side seemingly uh, always comes down. In this case, revenues uh, continue to be down. Uh, local aid is dropping precipitously. And new growth relating to development is affected by the uh, general economy. So uh, I stand before you as one who never believed that uh, one size uh, fits all. I've never found anything that I bought in the store that actually fit me, even though it says one size fits all. Um, a bit uncomfortable here today. I don't usually have to look up when I speak to a crowd, so it's unusual to be in this type of audience. But, um, 
when you talk about cities and towns, uh, just because cities and towns offer the same types of services, it doesn't mean that they are the same uh, types of entities. Um, I would argue, uh, being a city guy, that um, uh, cities generally require more revenue uh, to support the higher expenditures in, in things like public safety, in education, in social services, and in infrastructure. If you think about the cost of doing business in cities versus towns, and you see that uh, the revenue needed to support those um, expenses is, is much more substantial. So I, I wanted to be able to share with you um, what I thought the differences were, and I came up with the Battle of the Chels. Now I'm going to go back, I, as Barry mentioned, I, I am a native of Chelsea, I grew up in Chelsea, so <coughs> as a young kid, whenever it snowed out, I'd always be watching the television, waiting for the no school announcements. And Boston would happen, and Brooklyn would happen, and then we'd get to the seas, and I'd see Chell, and I'd be excited, and it would be Chell's foot. And then Chelsea wouldn't be, and I'd have to go to school. So I, I thought for this that I would look at urban versus suburban. I'd, I'd uh, take a look at Chelsea versus Chelmsford, because uh, when you look at population, according to uh, the data that I pulled off of uh, the state system, um, population is, is roughly the same. So it'll give you a good idea about how we spend money in a city uh, per uh, person versus how a suburb, uh, suburban community may uh, spend. Um, a big difference here is the median income. And you notice that uh, uh, the Chelmsford median income is uh, pretty substantial. In fact, interestingly enough, that median income is for uh, family median income. Chelmsford's per capita income is higher than Chelsea's family median income. Median income. So it's a, a great difference. Um, the budgets are, are um, roughly the same, but you see that more money is being spent in Chelsea, 27% 20, more money is being spent in Chelsea, and that turns into a per capita cost that's uh, much higher in Chelsea than it is in Chelmsford. One of the reasons we talk about public safety, um, two, uh, two communities with roughly the same population. Chelsea has almost twice as many uh, police officers. Uh, public safety is an important part of what uh, cities and towns have to provide, but um, you need more public safety officers in urban communities than you do in suburban communities. Another area, um, as I talked about, was uh, education. And you look at the two school systems, uh, 130 uh, kid difference in the two school systems, and yet Chelsea spends $69 million versus $56 million to Chelmsford, so a $13 million difference. Now, some people will look at these numbers and say, that you're overspending in Chelsea. You're spending too much money on education, you're spending too much money on public safety. But the reality is that um, in police, in uh, fire services, in inspectional services, um, in schools, uh, with infrastructure, the cost of doing business in cities is much more than it is in suburbs. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. This is going to be evident as I talk about um, education and why it costs more to educate kids in Chelsea than it does in Chelmsford. Um, Chelsea's percentage of low-income students, 78%. Uh, nothing wrong with being a low-income student. I was a low-income student in Chelsea at one time. Um, versus Chelmsford's uh, 6.4, you see what the state average is. Second language learners, those are, um, are learners whose uh, first language at home um, is not English. 83.5% uh, versus 7.3%. Uh, Yet the Commonwealth tells us in Chelsea that we need to get the same SAT scores, I'm sorry, the same MCAT scores, um, in the same graduation rates um, as those um, students in Chelmsford are achieving. So in order to achieve that, the Commonwealth provides offsets. And you see that the Commonwealth says to Chelsea, you can spend nine more dollars in state aid uh, to um, address the issues that your low-income students have, all the way from uh, free lunch um, to providing more after-school programs because uh, parents on home, um, they're out uh, working. Um, Chelsea, you can spend seven million dollars on second language learners, uh, providing English as a second language and, and more aids in classrooms to help people uh, transition, to help young students transition um, into better uh, uh, language proficiency. So when you look at what Chelsea spends on low-income and second language learners uh, versus what Chelmsford does, you can explain away the difference in the school budget. You know, so there's a concrete example of why it costs more uh, to do things in cities than it does in uh, suburbs. And in this case, we're fortunate to have uh, the state of Massachusetts as our partner uh, helping us to provide for those needs. I will brag for a minute that the Chelsea school system um, is one of the best urban school systems that you find. I have to emphasize urban uh, because there is a difference between an urban school system and a suburban school system. And uh, in Chelsea, if you show up ready to learn, you get a first-rate education. Now, I started that with if. And the if is the big part of, of the equation in Chelsea. What happens after school 
uh, for our school kids is almost as important as what happens during school hours. And so um, I've had conversations with the superintendent. Uh, we've talked to uh, the Hans Foundation and others. Uh, John's on the Hans board. And uh, we've explained that uh, the dollars that we now spend are probably better focused on doing after school activities and keeping um, kids uh, safe on the streets um, as opposed to worrying about what's happening in the school from uh, 8 to 2. So, uh, you know, we get into the show me the money time. Um, for cities and towns, this, uh, this is no different. Uh, two largest revenue sources for cities and towns are uh, local aid and property taxes. Um, urban communities are more reliant on local aid than others. I don't think that would be a surprise to anyone that knows uh, anything about cities and towns. The comment that I hear sometimes is that sometimes urban communities may be over-reliant. But this gets back to the kids versus parent relationship. Mr. and Mrs. Commonwealth won't let us kids go out and uh, hustle for ourselves. So um, I would relish the opportunity to go to my city council and say we need to raise property taxes more than 2.5% allowed by uh, Proposition 2.5. But I really don't have that opportunity. I would love to defend for the business uh, world why I want to raise sales tax, uh, but I don't have that um, great opportunity. So the state really constrains us. If the state's going to constrain urban communities and yet we have all these additional uh, pressures on expenditures, um, we need the state to continue uh, to support us through local aid. Why can't we all be like Cambridge? How many Cambridge residents are here? A few Cambridge residents. I hope someday. I hope to die and then wake up in Cambridge City Hall. <laughs> Here's the reason why. If you look at the 10 largest cities uh, in the Commonwealth, the average local aid uh, percentage of the budget is 42%. You see Cambridge in the middle at only 9%. Cambridge has $88 million in uh, excess capacity in Proposition 2.5 that they could raise. So Cambridge has free cash that we all dream about, the rest of us. So um, we all uh, would love to be like Cambridge, but the fact is that if you factor Cambridge's, uh, Cambridge out, if you take other cities like Newton out, and you look at you know, the rest of the university cities in, in Massachusetts, you see that um, the local aid number is around you know, this 42%. Um, you see that Chelsea is at 55%. Uh, uh, what that tells you is that um, in cities and towns, uh, we need local aid in order to balance our budgets. Yet, you know, can't the town get some love? You know, the, the towns, we always hear from the towns, you big cities take all the local aid, and yet, you know, the 10 largest towns in Massachusetts only account for 17% of their budget through uh, local aid. So, you know, the state recognizes, as it dishes out local aid, uh, that um, what happens in urban communities, and especially the topic tonight about urban finance, uh, needs to be supported more by state dollars than happens in, in uh, local towns. So you give me the Xbox, and I have the PS3, but why can't I have a Wii 2? Um, that's my, uh, my son's uh, familiar refrain. Um, you know, I had Pong when I grew up, and, and now there's all kinds of different platforms and they all want them, but, you know, um, in, uh, 10 largest cities and towns, as I mentioned, 42% average. The highest is Lawrence at 69%. Uh, lowest is uh, Newton at, at 7%. 69% Lawrence. And yet, um, Lawrence continues to struggle uh, making ends meet and arguably needs more state aid in order to uh, make things happen. I didn't go through all the towns to find out who the highest was, but um, I saw that uh, uh, Concord was uh, amongst the lowest at 6%. And, uh, you know, it's no surprise that you think of Newton, you think of more affluence, you think of Concord, you think of more affluence. Um, you think of Chelmsford versus Chelsea. Chelmsford's budget is 17% from the state, Chelsea's is 55% from the state. Um, you think of those more affluent communities, maybe have more opportunities uh, to raise money elsewhere, and that's why the state doesn't send their local aid that way. Um, a significant driver of the difference is uh, school aid. So, you know, I hear all the time as a, as a city manager who gets 50% of, of his budget from the state, well, um, you know, you're fortunate. But the fact of the matter is that 72% of that has to go to the schools. I have no control over that. If all of that money was coming into city government and I had some control over how that would be spent, um, I can assure you that I'd be spending it differently. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the state has made a major commitment, in fact, is required by the Constitution, uh, to make a major equipment to uh, a major, make a major commitment uh, to level the playing field for education, so that Chelsea's kids and Chelmsford's kids um, have the same opportunity uh, to get uh, a good education. So, uh, school aid is a big part of the local aid equation that uh, we see in cities and towns. So, finally, we'll get some pie here with the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know that I've ever done a PowerPoint without a pie, but here's here's um, a pie chart. Here's here's how it breaks down in terms of revenues for. Uh, the two communities. You see that property tax in Chelmsford 
accounts for 72% of its budget. Local aid is only 16%. And on the opposite side, you know, Chelsea, 25% of its budget is uh, property tax. Local aid is 55%. You know, when I look at that Chelsea 25%, um, it frustrates me to no end. Because in Chelsea, like every other community, we have people who say we don't want to spend any of our tax dollars. And yet when they're talking about their tax dollars, they're only talking about their property tax dollars. Chelsea shifts um, the burden of property tax from residents on to the business community. So the business community actually pays 175% of what it should pay, and, and residents pay about 67%. So roughly, if you're a resident in Chelsea, living in Chelsea, or a homeowner in Chelsea, after you get a residential exemption as well, um, you're paying something on the order of 12 cents for every dollar of service you get. You know, in that type of equation, uh, you would think that residents would be running and saying, geez, if I give you another 12 cents, can I get another dollar's worth of service? But, um, you know, we have allowed here in Massachusetts and throughout the country um, the uh, anti-tax people to take control over the dialogue that we have about services in our community. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here, but services in our community, services in our state, services in our country. And yet, here's an example in Chelsea where people are only paying 12 cents on every dollar, and they complain that they are spending too much on the services that they get. So at least they didn't pollute the harbor. I'm going to go over the little tax revolt that had happened here. You know, Massachusetts has had revolts over the years. The Tea Party was the most famous of revolt. But uh, Massachusetts, like many other communities in the country, went through a tax revolt during the uh, 70s and 80s. And um, in Massachusetts, that tax revolt led to the adoption of Proposition 2.5. It was adopted in the 1980s and uh, implemented in, in 1982. Um, many of you know what Proposition 2.5 is. If you don't, there are two major portions of Proposition 2.5. <laughs> One says that you, a city or a town can only charge 2.5% of its overall valuation. So if everybody here was uh, one property, I could charge 2.5% of what all your values were. And then in addition, Proposition 2.5 says every year I can only raise property taxes 2.5% more. So there are two caps that cities and towns have to worry about. So uh, when growth uh, comes up short, um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the growth of no more than 2.5% over last year. So if I raise a dollar this year, next year I can raise a dollar and 2.5 cents more. Um, the growth every 2.5 years comes up short when you think about it. 2.5 cents uh, uh, a year, or 2.5% a year. Chelmsford, this is, I found this interesting. Um, Chelmsford, because 72% of its budget is funded through property tax, if you multiply that 2.5%, Chelmsford, in theory, is guaranteed $1.8 million a year, or a 2% increase in its budget. Now, 2% isn't an awful lot, but when you look at what Chelsea is guaranteed, um, because Chelsea only gets 25% of its budget from, from uh, property tax, that 2.5% uh, growth every year only uh, limits Chelsea to 0.8%. Um, um, that's a big deal. You know, I, uh, Chelsea, the 0.8% or the uh, $800,000 we get a year, um, in some cases doesn't cover the increase in health insurance costs, let alone everything else that happens in the city. This is important in the context that we're going to be talking about Proposition 2.5 a, a little bit, I'm sorry, the local aid in a little bit. But keep this in mind that if cities that have to spend more have a difficult time raising money through property taxes, then local aid becomes even more uh, critical. So. These days, local aid is dropping. DOR right now says that uh, the municipal revenue growth for the two towns, Chelmsford is up 1.9%. Chelsea's revenue is actually down 1.5%. So even when I get that 0.8% uh, revenue increase, uh, because local aid is going down and other receipts are going down, uh, Chelsea is actually in, a, in a, an enviable position of having less to spend this year than we did last year. I would sing this, but I'm a terrible saying. Fairy tales come true. It could happen to you if you're a town at heart. <laughs> if you're a town at heart, this is very important. Proposition 2.5, as we all know, does allow for overrides. And that override allows voters to go uh, to the ballot box to increase property taxes. Um, overrides are almost exclusively a town financing tool. In many towns, they call it budgeting by override. They expect an override. There are communities that know they're going to do an override every year, and uh, they don't have the acrimony that exists in communities that um, have the opposite impression. Some uh, interesting facts, I thought. Since 2000, there have been more than 1,200 general override questions put before voters throughout the Commonwealth. Over 1,200. Only five of those 1,200 have been in cities. All the rest, the other 1,200, 1,195, have been in towns. 
in those five cities, I'm sorry, those five uh, questions were only in two cities. Brockton tried it once uh, in uh, 2008. They had three questions before the voters, all of them lost. Northampton lost its first one in 04 and finally won one in 09. <coughs> Let me say this a different way. In the decade that we are in, only one city in the Commonwealth during that 10 year period of time has been able to get one override passed. It's an amazing <coughs> thing. So when you look at how Proposition 2 and a half advocates say, well, you can go to the ballot box and make a case to increase your uh, real estate taxes. Well, in cities, it's so remote the chance that you get it that we don't even try to go to the ballot box. There isn't even a discussion about Proposition 2 and a half. Now, on the other side, small towns are most uh, likely to propose and adopt overrides. Aquinnah, former gay head, uh, 42 overrides during that period of time in 2000. Uh, 14 were successful, 28 weren't. West Tisbury, uh, 39, uh, 26 were successful, 13 weren't. Tallinn, um, 30 questions, 13 successful, and 17 weren't. Now those are small towns. Uh, Aquinnah is a great example. Um, 400 or so residents, uh, most one of the most affluent uh, communities uh, uh, during the summertime and in the in the winter time, it totally changes over. Those 400 residents come together and say, you know what, we can tax all those people that come during the summertime, all those rich people that come. So let's keep on raising taxes. Um, I look for some other examples, and, and as you look at, at how towns do it, um, Affluent Concord is a great example. 19 and 2 this decade, 21 times they've gone to the ballot box. They've raised almost $9 million in additional tax revenue to help support local services. And yet Lawrence, that struggles every day to put enough police officers on the street, um, hasn't been able to do the same thing. Uh, Chilmark, uh, again, another, uh, uh, Chilmark has the highest property values um, in the state. Um, highest property values in the state. Traditionally, you wouldn't be raising taxes. You wouldn't think you'd raise taxes in those types of communities. But they're 14 and 0 this decade in overrides. And since uh, Proposition 2 and a half was adopted, uh, 35 times out of 40 that they've gone to the ballot box, the residents of Chilmark have agreed to uh, raise their taxes. So they're out fairy tales. So the emperor has no clothes. Um, I tried this one on my intern. I hope there's some Boy George fans here. How many millions? Um, my intern, who was um, just turned 18, hadn't heard of Boy George. Um, I have to thank Barry. I've been singing the Comma Chameleon all day. And although we have huge budget problems, it's made me feel better. <laughs> I was going to try that. But, um, you know, one of the lines in uh, Comma Chameleon was, uh, let's see, um, I'm a man without conviction. And um, that's not the case for me tonight because I'm going to tell you uh, what the problems are with Proposition 2 and a half. I am going to take on that sacred cow, I am going to touch that third rail, and I'm going to let you know uh, where the problems exist with Proposition 2 and a half. So number one, uh, huge increases in local aid when Proposition 2 and a half uh, first were adopted um, masked the problems, and uh, unfortunately those days are as distant as a boy George hit. So, um, common chameleon will, uh, will have to